Okay, let us go ahead and get started again with the second half of session nine. Um, for the second part, what I want to do is I actually start thinking about not these kind of very simple criteria. That's kind of, oh, what your floor area is or what your height is. Those are some sort of very simple values we can go through and just pull right off the different elements. I want to start thinking about some things we might want to be able to compute off the element. And one of my classic examples is this whole notion of really just how direct this element is relative to the sun. So the idea is that for all these different panel elements or any surface, you know, you're often interested in that, but you don't know it right off. You can't just ask the element. Often what you have to do is go through and figure out, you know, if we drew a vector normal to the surface, something that sort of indicated, you know, what the surface normal is pointing away from that element, and then we thought about where the sun is, we get to this whole issue of how direct is it relative to where that sun's location is. Is it very close together, which is typically indicated by a very strong drop product, or is it very opposite, is it very negative or even zero, zero often being that you're perpendicular to what the, uh, the point of interest is. But to go through and do a little computation to get it out. So we're going to go back to the whole issue of panelizing a surface again, because that's often one thing we do it with, but we can do it with any surface. Just panelized surfaces often have a lot of surfaces that are pointing at slightly different directions, so they're easy ones to sort of see the effect and work with. So. To work with this, here's the roadmap for what we're up to. We're going to go ahead and start by basically trying to find some normals okay, to the panels. So we'll have a surface, we'll put some panels on the surface, and then we're going to go through and just try and figure out where some normals are. And there's going to be a couple of interesting ways of doing that. We could go through and either create surfaces from the quad points. Okay, or we can create best fit planes from the quad points. And there's two different, well, there's sort of an advantage to each of those different strategies. Best fit planes tend to be very quick. You sort of take four points, and it's very quick to sort of create a little uh, rectangle or a, just a, well, a quadrilateral sort of based upon like uh, those four different points and kind of put the normal relative to that. Surfaces is a little bit different. Let me kind of show you, if I can, what the difference might be by drawing. Okay. So the idea is, in general, we have some sort of surface. It's some curvaceous surface. And you're going through and you're panelizing it. Okay, super. If I go through and now, uh, try to figure out what the normal is to any specific panel. For example, let me do it relative to this one. What I can do is this. I could either go through and say that, let me do the second one first. I'm going to take those four different points, which are the quad points, the points on the end. Okay. And based on that, I'm going to make a plane that goes through those four different points. Now, on that plane, what I can do is go through and compute a normal. So I'll compute a normal. It'll be perpendicular to that. And that'll be a really good first order approximation for almost any panel. Where it starts to make a slight difference, though, is if you have very curvaceous panels. Okay, The place where that happens to end up in the middle of the panel, um, if the panel panels are very curvaceous, may not actually be the best reflection of what's going on. Because if, for example, let me exaggerate this. I had a panel which is very curvy. Okay. Drawing the four different points and approximating the surface might lead to a vector that comes up like this. But if I actually went on the surface of the panel, or the surface, and I went up to 50% to here and 50% to here, and actually plotted a point on the surface, the normal might actually be just a little bit different than that just because of the curvature of the surface itself, as opposed to the first order approximation being the rectangular surface. So it's 
a very small difference. It's not going to affect us for most of what we do, but there is a slight difference. If you go to the surface and you say put it at the 50, 50 spot, it's a little bit better than just sort of taking the rectangular approximation and doing the normal to that. Okay, but it's a little more work, so it takes a little bit longer to do that. So it's really whether or not you need to do that. But both strategies work. We'll show you how to do it both ways. Okay, let me start before we dive into that though. You sort of understand the difference between the two? Okay, because it's really, it's just for curvaceous surfaces, especially if you use a very chunky sort of uh, panelization, first order approximating as a series of rectangular planes, you know, it's, it's okay, but it's, it's not as close as you might want it to be. Okay, after we go through and kind of put some surface uh, normals on this, the next thing we're gonna do is basically figure out where is the sun, okay? And the sun actually has, oh, a vector. The sun actually has a kind of a value right now called current. That sort of grabs and read it where the current sun is located. <laughs> and we can get something called the sun direction. And the sun direction goes ahead and gives us a vector that's pointing in the same direction. So the, uh, as though you're pointing from zero to the sun, Okay, then we go through and normalize it. Okay, normalizing it just says that what we're gonna do is take any vector and reduce its length to one. So we're gonna go through and do the, oh, the x squared, y squared, z squared. We're gonna make it all eventually, we're gonna get it down to a unit length of one. And that's gonna be useful to us because, you know, we're sort of interested in it on a scale of zero to one, not on a scale of zero to a thousand or whatever it actually happens to be commuted to. Then finally, we're going to go through and compute the strength of the orientation by basically taking your vectors, the sun vectors, and we're going to figure out like how close they are to each other. If they line up perfectly, okay, that means that sort of you're heading the same direction as it is to the sun, or if we really thought about it, it'd almost be the negative direction in terms of the sun shining on you. But if you're very close to zero, you have a very bad dot product there. That means you're close to you're like a perpendicular to it. You're off. I think I'm wrong in what I'm writing down here. Uh, but we'll see. <laughs> I think that's, well, let me watch that one right there. I think I have the wrong thing written there. I think that should be zero. But again, this is the stuff that will confuse me again. Well, again, this is one of those things. Every time I do this, and I swear I've done this many, many times, it's like, <laughs> I always have to kind of rethink it five times because you can sort of talk me in circles about this stuff sometimes. But we'll see it when it actually sort of plays out. I think it's actually that's closer to zero. I think I'm misstating that on the map right there. But we'll see. Okay, if you can, let's go ahead and open up uh, 9.3. And you'll see we should have just a, uh, kind of a very ordinary little surface. This surface we worked with a little while ago when we first started panelizing. I'm doing a little regenerating on my side in terms of upgrading it to 2016. Let's see how it opens for your side. It just takes too long. So I have a surface here. You can see it's already sort of panelized. There's all these little panels kind of hanging around all over it. So there's a little bit of a dynamo scripting that's already going on, which is basically taking those and taking a U and a V and subdividing that surface into all those individual panels. But on all those little flat panels right there, those are like tightly, slightly twisted panels, we can go through and kind of think about like uh, surface normals. But let's go and take a look at the dynamo script and we'll get back to where we are here. 
So if you go into add-ins, open up Dynamo, and let's open up that 9.3. We'll start with 1A. So at the beginning of this, this should all look sort of familiar. We have a surface which is selected. We have some integer sliders, which are the number of panels in each row. We actually have a seamless panel we're going to put on there. This is kind of an interesting function, adaptive panels on surface. You might sort of wonder about that one. I think that came out of Lunchbox. Is it red on yours, or is it not red on yours? Is it, is it highlighted for you, or is it uh, gray? It's gray. It's gray? Excellent. Okay. It's a custom node. It seems to have a lot of functionality built into it. If you want to open it up and take a look, let's say adaptive panels, let's edit that custom node. Now see what it does inside. Doesn't that also have a custom node as well? Say again? Doesn't this also have a custom node in it for time? It does. And you can nest them together. So we have a number of rows and number of columns. It kind of is creating, kind of based on the panels, it's creating the surfaces. So this one is parameter, flattening it, quads, the secondary custom. This can vary many deep. You know, it can be as high or low as you want. Flatten it, ultimately adaptive component by points. So you know that chunk of code. You've done that chunk of code. And this is really all now encapsulated into a single uh, custom node. So we can close that up. We're going to cross our fingers and hope that part of the code is working, because I think it is. We'll come over here and, oh, even in here right now it says no. Let's go ahead and do this. I'm going to, uh, yeah, we'll just leave it like this right now. Let's just go ahead and uh, I'm going to take out the panels just to make sure that we're getting them all. This is where we want Claire's switch that Andrew's going to engineer for us, which says that I'm going to select all instances of this panel. and get rid of it. Let's run this and see how it looks. Run is started. Let's see what's going on. It's not definitely doing anything too awfully uh, scary in here, so we'll see. It's based on the number of panels, whether it works. I'm still running. There we go. I got those panels in there. They're looking pretty good. You can sort of see I have, actually this custom node is kind of an interesting one. It's actually returning two different things. It's returning not only the panels, which is useful if I want to grab the panels, it's actually returning the quad points. So I can sort of return several different things. Where that actually exists in the custom node, if you want to look back in there again, is, oh, as, I pad around over here. You'll see, there's a couple of different outputs. There's an output over here, which is for quad points, just to fork those off. There's the components we could fork those off. If I wanted to go polluting, if I wanted to go the surface, uh, let's put in the points there. And that's just a bunch of points. I can really fork off at anything as many different outputs as I want. It really depends on what you want access to. Okay, so. I got both the components and the quad points, and that's going to be useful to us, because sometimes you want to think about the points, sometimes you want the panel itself. Okay. So let me pause there. Does everyone have some sort of surface hanging around in the background? Beautiful. Okay. So let's go ahead, and we're going to look at a couple different things in here. We are going to say that if we could go through and grab groups of points, and we want to make some planes out of those points, that's just little uh, rectangular planes, little best fit planes. We could take those groups of points, take them over to plane by best fit for the points. Okay? And you see if you expand on down from there, you should get a bunch of planes. Take care. So, Check out all these planes. I got one plane for every panel. 
So what's it doing? It's just taking the four different corner points and trying to make a nice like rectangular plane in there. Or a plane, not so rectangular. Okay, super. From those planes, what I can do now is say, let's go through and put some normals to those planes. So there's something called plane normal. Go ahead and run that. And you'll see that what is returned <coughs> is a whole bunch of vectors. Now, just so you can sort of see, hang around back over here in the background. So you can zoom in there. Let me move that around a hair just so you can see. Maybe orbit this. You gonna orbit for me? If you look at the surface, I'm not sure if you can see it on yours. Can you see on mine? There's these extra little, little, little stubby hairs that are kind of poking up in the middle. Those are the surface normals. Okay. So those are for each of the different planes. You sort of see the normal kind of poking out of there. And we're going to play a game with surface normals in that generally when we do the surface normals, they sort of end up pointing in the direction you want them to point in. But every once in a while, they don't. And this just has to do with the math and how it's computing things in the background in Dynamo. So you'll see, as I look at the surface, it looks like most of the normals are pointing outward. They're pointing up and out. But I actually sort of see one hiding over back here in the corner that has a little word. It seems to be pointing inward. Okay? And this is something we're going to learn to worry about. Because for every normal, you're never quite sure what it thinks is inward and what it thinks is uh, outward. So we're going to compute these normals, and in a little while, we're going to go start looking at all the normals and relative to some origin point, sort of say, are you pointing in or are you pointing out, and maybe adjusting them. Okay, but as a starting point, it does a pretty good job. So that's a whole bunch of uh, kind of just surface normals to the planes, or normals to the planes. And that is strategy like one. Just Take all those and go through and just kind of make the plane normals. Okay. And the other <laughs> strategy, though, we could use instead is we'd say, let's take those points, let's go through and make a surface, okay, and then what? Go through and feed in the surface and go to the 50 50 slot, okay, which will give us sort of points and then ultimately surface vectors. So, we want to follow the surface as opposed to sort of going to the planes. What I can do is grab these little surfaces. You'll see it's going to give me, if I run this, a whole bunch of points which are the center points of all of those different surfaces. And then ultimately, on the other side, it's going to give us normals to all those surfaces. And actually, there's something here that I think is wrong in my logic. In terms of this, I'm thinking about this. I'm still just taking those four points. I think what I've got to do to really be accurate to the curvature is not just take these four points. I've got to basically figure out where that point would be relative to the coordinates on the true surface. So I think that's right when I, when I did this right here, surface point parameter, or when I'm making this curved surface right here, I'm not really on the curved surface. I'm just sort of forming the surface out of the four corner points. So I think there's a little flaw in my logic right here. But don't worry about that for right now, because it's all going to kind of work its way out just a little bit. OK, and fix that part. We'll just maybe use the plane numbers right now as a way of doing it. Okay. So I got all these different little vectors. See all the little vectors hanging around? They're looking pretty good. I actually have several different vectors. And in many ways, I expect these two vectors to be really similar to each other. But I don't think there's really all that kind of an unusual curvature to this thing. OK. The next thing I need to make this work, though, you'll see I have these vectors. And vectors are sort of described in terms of x, y, z values. OK, I have a bunch of them sort of pointing up. 
is I need to figure out about where that sun is. And if I were going from the origin of my system here to the sun, what kind of vector it would have. And there's a very kind of handy way of doing that. There's this part right in here. There's a function called sun settings current and then the sun direction, and then we can create a vector to it and normalize it to give it a point 0.1. So let's go back over to Revit and sort of see what that does. So if you come back over to Revit and you're hanging around over here, we don't see the sun right now, although I can turn on the sun. Here's the sun right now. So you see the sun is kind of hanging around out here in the sky. Now the sun's going to be in a slightly different position at different times of the year and different times of the day. That's all okay. So I could go ahead and oh change it to be uh, 10 in the morning or something like that. The sun will be a little bit different. You sort of see the shadows on this thing in the background look a little bit different. But what sun current does, sun settings current is, it says for the Revit model right now, just tell me what is the altitude, what is the azimuth, okay? And then based on that, we can go through and compute a vector. So if we were computing a vector to the sun's position, it would look like this. It goes negative 88 in the x direction, negative in the y direction, and positive in the z. So it's based on a length of 100. Okay, but what we want to do is, oh, so that we don't over amplify things. We want to reduce that so it's scale, it's really pointing in the same direction, but it's only a length of one as opposed to 100, because all our other vectors have a length of one. Otherwise, we'll be overly biasing it towards the sun <coughs> when we do the dot product. So, we're gonna go ahead and take that sun's vector and normalize it. Let me go ahead and run that. Now, it should change a little because I changed the position of the sun in the sky. So now we have something here. It has a length of one also. So theoretically now, we could go through and take all those vectors, which are on the plane normal, or I can take all these on the surface normal, either one of those. I can take all those. I can take all these sun vectors, and I can dot plot them. Okay. And now we should get a bunch of values anywhere from negative 1 to 1, just based on how close we are. And we'll use that. So I'll say plane normal. And I'll say vector normalized. Great. And let's run that. So I'm expecting a whole bunch of values to come out of this. Let's see what they look like. Everywhere from negative 0.3, negative 0.3, some positive 0.5s. I saw a 0 0.9 in there, I thought. Okay, all the way up to 0.5. So we have some different values which are computing here, which are really telling us how closely aligned those different normals are. And again, the way I usually interpret this is, is the closer to zero, the uh, more perpendicular, the more positive, you're actually sort of getting the uh, you know, the closer alignment, the more negative, you're actually kind of going in the opposite direction. But let's kind of take a look at it and see if we can sort of uh, develop a sense of intuition about it. So, we have all these different values. Let's kind of pause there for a second. You got a bunch of values computed? Excellent. Yes, sorry. Okay. Direction to zero, the more perpendicular the vector or the point? It is, it's the more perpendicular the vector. So the plane. And the plane would be sort of the plane would be perpendicular to the sun too. So that would be so that would mean that the sun is here. I gotta always think about this. This is like this is what really hurts my brain. Okay. And if the plane is here, the normal is here, that means that the plane is facing away from the sun. Okay. Whereas Yeah. That would be considered very direct. And that's 
I think that's a dot product of a positive one. Whereas this over here, again, I'm about to be proven wrong, so I always am. That should be a minus one. Okay, where that's a zero. Okay, but <laughs> since I had since I had that written wrong, I'm a little worried about that. Okay, I could take these vector dot products and stuff like that, and well, let's just even kind of go for that in terms of what's going on. Here's what I start to do is, oh, what do I want to have numbers there? That's all fine, yada, yada, yada. Uh, this remapping of the numbers just basically is saying, go through and, well, hang on. If they're all upward, then I wouldn't have any negative, yada, yada, yada. So I think I'm going to have to sort of mess this a little bit. You notice know, some are negative, right? That's because some of the vectors are actually sort of pointing like in the opposite direction, some are positive, stuff like that. So we actually have a little custom function put together to go through and flip them. And let me show you what it does. It's actually sort of a very similar little function, or simple function. Yeah. In this case, let's kind of zoom on out so you can sort of see. Theoretically, yeah, unless you were looking at the underside of this thing, all the vectors should be potting up in some way. You know, they should all be positive in some way. Maybe zero at the worst case. Okay, but they shouldn't be negative. So what's happening is we're actually getting some values that are negative. And that's just sort of a error in the way the math is being done right now, in terms of just where the surface normal would be computed, whether it would be upward or outward. So what we did to compensate for that is set up a function that just goes through and does this. We take a bunch of vectors as inputs. Let me edit this custom node. And we say, OK, Mr. Vector, you're coming on in. Let's figure out uh, these different values in here. Basically, if the z, that is the vector, one of the z values seems to be pointing down, Okay, basically grab the x, y, z's, okay, and flip them. Basically flip the x, flip the y, and flip the z. So if you were pointing down, we're going to flip you up instead. Okay, so if that's true, go ahead and grab those values. If it's false, okay, if z wasn't greater than less than zero, which means that it's pointing in the right direction already, just pass the original vector. So all this that double function does is it flips vectors inside out. Okay. Yes. Okay. And uh, by upward, I mean that they have a z value which is zero or greater. Okay. Because if you have a z value which is less than zero, I'm just going to flip you. Okay. But in terms of vector arithmetic, is the idea of like multiplying each of the components by negative one as a flipping of the vector? Does that work? Okay. So this function is going to change things just ever so slightly. What will happen is I come back over. And I take those plane vectors, and you see all those plane vectors are kind of hanging around over here. Okay, but oh, some of them had negative z values and some had positive z values. All those negative z's kind of hanging around in there. What this function does is it just flips them. So now when I run this, they all have positive z values. <laughs> So even the negatives have all been flipped over. So they're all positive z's. Okay. Now, if I do the dot product of those, I expect that I won't have any negative values. I should have all like just zeros to ones, something like that. So I'll run that again. Oops. What's it complaining about? Could not find a version that takes the argument array single fun. Oh, it's because I have the list in there on. Wait. Oh, let me warn you about this. Well, let's see if this would actually work. I didn't mean to have to get into list mapping. Let me pull that across. I, I pulled list map across, which I'm going to tell you about in just a second. Let me try pulling vectors across, see if that works. 
okay, that's gonna work. No, that's doing something very weird. So all my values are, oh, it's because I'm crossing them with myself. <laughs> like, never mind. Um, let's see, I just made a mistake there. I took my original plane normals, I took my flip normals, and I got they by not crossing them, either that they were in alignment or completely opposite of each other. That actually is perfectly sensible, because if they were flipped, the value is negative one. I pulled the wrong thing in here. What I really meant to pull in, let me zoom out here, was these flipped normals. Let me get rid of this map for now, because I don't think I need it. And what I want to cross it with on the other side is the sun vector. So check this out. I have a lot of values. They're all between 0 and 1, hopefully. From 0.25. So the lowest ones are the ones where the dot product is kind of giving you the most perpendicular, so the least uh, amount of directness. The highest ones are the ones with the most direct. Okay, so that's sort of making sense. I have two numbers. Still, that's yeah. an interesting thing. Yeah. Where are they? Are they like in a specific spot? Yeah. Right up front? Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. Also, there's some layering. Okay, are you pulling out of normals pointing upward, or which one are you pulling out? All normals pointing upward. Okay, so you took plane vector to it? Yes. Interesting. It could be still like a little bug in there somewhere, but let me kind of see on the other side too. Okay, so you got that, and I'll put it upward. And then the vector dot product. Oh, so, oh, so hang on. So when you just have two grids that are so far curved away, you end up with negatives. Could be. I'm wondering if that's actually possible. So, yeah. so where are these negatives are showing? If he's going up there. Interesting. Slightly <laughs> negative. Mm -hmm. Okay. No worries. I think there's something just about. Yeah. It's the, the geometry. The geometry is a little messy. It's just too far away. From You're glad I drew the. Um, yeah, okay. but we'll go ahead and kind of play with it <laughs> and then adjust this because it's okay. So great. You have these numbers. They're predominantly this way. It is at sunset still. My sun is still at sunset. Oh, is your sun down in the sky? Yeah. Oh, good. I not know how to do that. Hold um, back up to, yeah, kind of so middle of the day. How about you? Okay, that might make a difference. Yeah. Let's run it. Okay. Yeah, Julia. Yeah. Yeah vector line, so there's two that are obvious negatives out there. Oh, wait, how'd you show the vector lines? Uh, I drew line by point and direction. So, so it's really obvious about the porcupine. Yeah. Okay, how are we doing on your negatives now? Uh, okay. Yeah, I think I'm good. Beautiful. So what's happening is, just based upon even the whole notion of upwards, if the sun was low enough in the sky, still messed us up because it was kind of at zero. So we're eventually going to talk about not just upward, we're going to go with something called outward, which is we sort of say there's an origin in the center. That's a little more accurate still. But upward's a pretty good starting point approximation if the sun is up. Great. So you got some vector dot products. These dot products are actually the strength of the sun in the sky, which is actually kind of cool, or the strength of your directness. So what can we do with this? One thing I tend to like to do is, since these values, oh, they kind of go from zero to one, and that's kind of okay, but we can go ahead and, oh, it's almost remap it a little bit in terms of uh, giving ourselves a color range. Like, if I say, take those numbers and remap them between zero and one, it's just gonna take those same numbers and just spread them, so the lowest one's zero, the highest one's one. It's just a kind of rescale, okay? So you can do that if you want to or not. When I go through and run that, okay, again, it's a slightly rescale value. You sort of see that 0 0.309 became 0 0.072 because it's near the lowest and the higher ones are probably right at one because we sort of rescaled it there. Okay. Now, we're ready to do a little bit of an overriding of color. So let's kind of think about this. For example, we could go through and, well, actually, let's do something sort of really, okay. 
kind of interesting. Go to, if you can, open up. Oh, let's see if I can find which one I want. Say no. It's the part where I'm actually going to reassociate the color. Go to 2A. No, nope, that's actually sort of taking me to the same place. Okay. Oh, I know where I want to be. Okay. Those are all just giving you the numbers and stuff like that. Uh, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll go to the next place. Okay. Where I want to go now is I basically want to say, hey, for these values of a range of 0 to 1, let's map them to sort of a color range and go anywhere from like blue to red or something like that. And where you find that is, if you come over here and say color, let's see if I can find a range. Let's talk about what you got. So this actually expects a couple of different colors, okay? And, and the, a value that you're gonna plug in. So let's talk about how you'd use this. If I wanted to go, for example, from blue to red, um, zero <coughs> being blue, red being one, so that the most direct sun has that high value, I'll say color ARGB, so I'll get that again. I'm gonna do a couple of different colors. Okay, so for my pure red, it would be 255 on the red. For a pure blue, it'd be 255 on the blue. Okay, so what this function does is you can give it two or even three colors, okay? You can go ahead and say the colors, sort of say where they're gonna be on the range, everywhere from zero to one, and then when you feed it values, it'll choose the color that's parked in between there. So it's actually a really cool function. So how this works is I can say list create, actually not as code block. Move that. Do my little list creation. Where'd it go? Did it come in? There it is. So I'm gonna put my two different colors in the list. I'm gonna start with blue at my low end. I'm gonna do red as my high end. Okay, now it wants to know the indices. So that's gonna say, it just wants a list that says, where should the blue go and where should the red go on the value of like one to zero to one, sort of on that scale. So I can create something that says zero, one. Actually, the best thing would be to make a list out of it. So now what's gonna happen, if I go through and feed in a value from zero to one, it's gonna go and between the red color, which is at zero, and the blue color, which is at one, it's gonna go through and find that color in the range. So, coming on over here, I'll grab those and pull the values. And now cross your fingers. It should go through and for all those different values, just give us a color value. Okay, so you see my little range, it's going from blue to red, everywhere from zero to one. So what this is gonna return is a list of colors that correspond to these different values that I fed in. Okay, and we're ready to start mapping that over to all the elements. Okay, so in terms of mapping them on the elements, let's just kind of take a look at what actually came out back over here. If I say watch over here. No. Maybe 
you'll see it's just a big old flat list of colors. So if you have a list of colors, a big old flat list of colors, and you happen to have a big old flat list of panels somewhere, how can you get them together? Anyone? One of my favorite functions. Element override. So what do I got to pull in there? This is where it's useful. What I actually want to do is get the panels. The panels are what I'm going to override. So way back over here, seems like so long ago, I'm going to grab those panels. As the list of elements. Oh, actually, it didn't remap them from smallest to largest. It just took the values. It didn't change the order. It just changed the scale. Oh, got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it's just kind of rescaling them, but keeping them in the same order. So in theory, now when you take that element and you take a bunch of colors and you take a bunch of elements and you get them all together. When you go through and run this now, why do I keep doing that? That's Windows having fun with me. Give that a run. Oh, run completed with warnings. Don't like that. What is it not like about my element over in view? I got a bunch of colors here. Got a bunch of colors here. Got a bunch of elements there. What's it saying it's not happy about? The view type does not support visibility graphics overrides. What view am I in? Shaded. I should be here. Oh, am I kind of hanging around right now? Am I still in a family? No, I'm going to write the project. That should be OK. Element. Should be that. Should be that. Let me try that again. No, nope. still have to give me a warning there. What's it complaining about? I'm thinking, 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 because I don't. Element color operation failed. The view type, visibility graphics overrides. What's your element type right now? The adaptive element. Let's see. I'm pulling the, the family rectangular seamless panels. They should be OK. Hmm. I suspect there's something else going on that's a little bit strange in here, because the logic is kind of good. It's telling me it doesn't like the view. We got colors, we got those. It says it just doesn't like element override color in view. Let me try it over here. You know, the funny thing about so many Dynamo things is if you can't get it to work over here, it won't work over there. So I'll say override color in view. He said, just try it and rev it. Is it the surface? How do you the surface in view? Hmm? I oh, know, worries. I'm just trying it here, over here, blah, blah, blah. Surface pattern. Why is it not showing it there? Because I just did the same thing. I got my rectangular seamless panel. I got this. I should show it's consistent colors. I can turn off the mass. Pattern, solid. Did you say a fly? Hmm? There was a button for a fly. Oh, let's try that too. Now that would be there. So again, close down and we'll do what? And then delete all the instances and open to a again. Oh, I thought it's because we used one. I suspect you're. I suspect you're actually on it. So let's do this. Let's save this away because you know everything about our logics looks appears to be right. Right? That seems to be okay. 
So let's close this and we'll go ahead and adjourn for anyone who has to run out of here. But let me close out of that and even reopen the whole thing again. Oh, I wonder what's going on. Say. Well, whatever. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I, I suspect you're actually right in terms of it's just, it's more just us fussing with Dynamo and Reddit and stuff like that, or in terms of the versioning and stuff like that, because that logic should work. So if anyone wants, let's do this. If anyone wants to stick around and watch me fix it, please do. If you need to uh, kind of run out and get to another class or something like that, please do. So, so that uh, I don't want to keep you guys hanging. But that should work. In fact, if you go in and open up, it's the next example, I think it's 9.4 or something like that. It actually has all that stuff implemented in it. So that should be okay. Let's try this again. So the idea is over here. Let's select all those. Take That's them out. What the select hmm? What you just did was that select? Oh, that's just. The I just I just selected all and then yeah just the did the text. Yeah. Part of the code that says select face. Oh, that is selecting the mass face, which you can't see right now. It is back under masses. It's that thing. Okay, so what it is is we had a, a face and we were going through and grabbing the surface and putting panels all over that. Okay, so let me try this one last thing to see if we can. Okay, I got my colors, I got all that stuff. I should be watching panels. Let's go ahead and try. colors, didn't get any errors. What's it looking like back over here? Check that out. Okay, so why the red is showing up over there is because the uh, sun's over there kind of late in the sky. If we went ahead now and moved the sun to early in the day, you can see that over on this side, the panels are getting red, even blue on the other side. So, fun little practice things if you want to sort of try implementing this. Try if you want to on your bus stop or whatever your little exam uh, structure that you work on. Yeah. See if you can go ahead and just pull in this whole thing of you got the panels already. See if you can get normals to that and get a sun and see if you can go through and kind of get that last little chunk of code in terms of doing some colorizing. It, uh, you know, it was an awful lot of fun and very easy. We'll pick this up next time in terms of now that we've been able to compute some values, what we actually do with that value. Okay, because it all starts with colorizing, or we can change apertures, or turn things on and off, or based on that color, that directness value, you might be in the in pool or the out pool. Okay, and so how we go through and use that to start having our structures respond to that information. Okay, let us adjourn. Thank you for patiently hanging on. Okay, and we will quit for today. <laughs>